uh, so if you're down tonight, uh, you're a good candidate for the strength of the Lord. Just don't think that you're down and out and kaput and at the bottom. Well, tonight we're studying the man named Philip. The scripture here tonight said that he was Philip, here's his title now, the evangelist, which means he was an evangelizer. He was a soul winner. He was a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And we'll be back and forth from Acts 21 to Acts number 8. We'll see in the book of Acts where he put this, you see uh, just a little segment of his life where uh, he put into practice, he shows us, uh, God's word tells us and shows us exactly uh, what this word evangelist means. And so, uh, you know, when Paul Paul went to Caesarea, uh, he had a friend there. And these guys, you know, birds of a feather flock together. You are who you associate with. And I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I can tell you uh, what your future holds by the company you keep. And uh, it also said about Philip that he was one of the seven. Did you catch that? Uh, that's not a group of uh, gang members, okay? Uh, he, it, well, deacons, some, no. Uh, but uh, uh, he was one of the original seven deacons uh, of the early church. And uh, does anybody know why that uh, Philip was not in Jerusalem? Uh, he's in Caesarea. I got one word for you. His name was Saul. And uh, he brought havoc and mayhem on the early church, and the early church, Acts 1 and 8, it says, go into all the world, and both in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth, and the church heard the great commission, they won all of Jerusalem, but they didn't go from Jerusalem, both, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and in Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, so God used Saul before he was ever saved to spread the church out, and the dissimulation and the distribution of all those people. So there was Philip way over there in Caesarea, and many other Christians were just everywhere. Uh, but you know, the Bible says they went everywhere preaching the word. Oh. So sometimes bad things happen because Christians just aren't obedient. But I want you to notice what happens when the Spirit speaks to Philip about going to a place way out in the middle of nowhere, dry, desolate, desert-like, and uh, Gaza, and it's still the same name, Gaza. That's where the Philistines, uh, I think Mr. Uh, Goliath himself was from this town called Gath and, uh, uh, in Gaza. And so here we are, uh, we see in Acts 8, let's go back to the book of Acts chapter number 8. Are you still happy to be saved tonight? Got some good news at the end of the service, and uh, God's working in our church. I love it, I love it, I love it. I sensed a very special spirit in the church this morning, and how easy it was uh, to preach to you uh, the Word of God. It was just amazing. Someone in this church is praying. I don't know who it is, but I thank each one of you who have a part. We never know which, which prayer is going to touch heaven's uh, 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 mercy and uh, get God's attention, so just keep praying, church. You know what I want our, our church to be known for? I want our church to be a praying church, a praying church. And, uh, you know, the Lord didn't say in his word that my house shall be called the house of preaching. He said, my house shall be known and called a house of prayer. And so very little praying going on in Christendom today, and that's why we're not seeing much, uh, you know, as far as results is concerned. I'm not looking for the results and counting results, okay? Uh, but uh, I know the one who brings the results. I'm just depending on him. Amen? He's the one that, uh, you know, Paul planted, uh, Apollos watered, but it was God who gave. The increase. So here we are in Acts chapter number 8. Are you there yet? Say amen. This is the chapter. Remember that they were scattered uh, abroad. And here's Philip down here. 
Look in verse, uh, uh, if you will, in verse number 5. Let's go there, first of all. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and remember the, the Great Commission in Acts 1 and 8 again, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. And the Jews hated the Samaritans. They were, a, a diff, they, they, they were disobedient over in Babylon. I could go into great detail and tell you exactly what they were up to, but they were intermarrying with the people of the Babylonian people in those 70 years. And Ezra had to ask them. He didn't ask them. He demanded them. They had to give up the children that were born uh, uh, illegitimately uh, over there in Babylon. They had to give up their wives that they'd had over there. But the Samaritans did not. They didn't do as the rest of the Jews did. And so for this, they were hated. And, and so when, uh, when, when the Lord said to go to Samaria, you know, he said, I must needs go through Samaria, which means the Lord's never going to ask us to do something he hasn't already done. I hope pastor would never ask you to do something that I'm not presently doing. And so uh, here, here we see Philip. He went down to Samaria and preached Christ. He's the first one that obeyed the Lord and went to these people who were hated and despised. The Jews hated them. They would go all the way around uh, Samaria. They didn't even want to travel through that, that state. And so it says, and the people with one accord, I'll tell you what, there were some hungry folks over there. Uh, they need to hear the word of God. You know, you know, it may not be the ones that we want to go to. It may not be the neighborhoods that we like to distribute the, the literature and to give the soul winning presentation. But may I say those people may be the most receptive. <laughs> and notice it says, With one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles. Woo! Wow! The miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed. I can tell you what the problem was. They had a sin problem. Amen? i tell you what America's problem is tonight. America has a sin problem, a lot of unclean spirits, and they need to come out. And the Lord is the only one that can do so. And notice there was great joy in that city because of all of these things that were going on. And see, there was a great revival. People were getting saved. Man, lives were being changed. God was answering prayer. All kinds of things were going on. Now let's look at verse 26. After all the great revival, after all that was happening there, notice verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. Now he'd been obedient already to what God told him to do, to go to Samaria. But in the midst of all that revival, God said, I want you to go. And notice where he want, wanted him to go. And go towards the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasure, and come to Jerusalem for to worship. He was there for Pentecost. He had come to worship the Lord. He was probably of uh, Jewish descent of some kind, and he was returning. He was going across this Gaza Strip there. He was returning and sitting in his chair. It read, Isaiah the prophet then the Spirit said unto Philip, not only did God tell him to go uh, to this place called Gaza, the Holy Spirit was very explicit and said, notice what he said, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said unto, understandest uh, thou uh, what thou readest? And he said, uh, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him in the place of the scripture which he read was this he said he was as a uh, led as a sheep to the slaughter and as uh, like as a, a lamb dumb before uh, his, his shearer so he openeth not his mouth he's speaking about Jesus there from Isaiah 53 if you have any Jewish friends uh, read Isaiah 53 uh, to them and they may not accept the gospel message but they'll accept Isaiah number 53, and in his humiliation, 
his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet of the uh, prophet this, of himself uh, or of some other man. Underline that, some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He was a good gospel preacher, amen? He, he, he was a man that could preach uh, at the drop of a hat, he would drop the hat. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? God willing, we'll stir the waters at the end of the service tonight. And Philip said, Here's the condition now. This is the verse that has been taken out of the new versions of the Bible. It's not there. If it is there, it is so mysterious misconstrued it is so changed that you can't even tell anything about it and I'll tell you why in just a moment Philip said if thou believest with all thine heart there's a condition of being baptized you have to have believers baptism you have to have scriptural baptism in that uh, salvation comes first so the baptismal regeneration people who believe that infants should be baptized or that somehow uh, you baptize them before they have the opportunity to come to the age of accountability and believe on the Lord Jesus as we have, they take that step out, these modern denominational churches, and they just baptize you whether you want it or not. That's why the verse is taken out of the new versions of the Bible because they baptize you as an infant. But where in the Bible you can find where an infant is being baptized. That's why we call it believer's baptism. And here's the condition. If you believe with all your heart, kind of hard for an infant to believe with all their heart. Kind of hard for them to understand that they're a sinner. Water baptism doesn't save anyone's soul. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Know the fount I know, but nothing but the blood of Jesus. He said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believe with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I think he's a pretty good candidate. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Notice they went down into the water. If you read in Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 3, you'll find when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, he came up out of the water. So you tell me from the Scriptures, what is scriptural baptism? One must be completely buried in the water. We're going to cover it Sunday night. Uh, from now, we're going to be over in the fellowship hall. We're going over uh, the ordinances, the first ordinance that we covered uh, in our Lord's Supper nights over here uh, in the fellowship hall was the Lord's Supper. Next Sunday night, we'll be covering baptism, but we're kind of covering it tonight. Maybe we should have took Lord's Supper tonight. Anyway, but when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The eunuch who just gotten saved. Then they gladly received his word, were baptized, and added unto the church. Acts 2, verse number 41. You see the joy that was in the eunuch. You can sense it there in the scriptures. He went on his way rejoicing. The reason he was rejoicing because his heart had been cleansed and he'd been obedient in the first step of obedience in scriptural baptism. Can you see now from the scriptures? Why the Bible calls Philip the evangelist. He's a soul winner. He's getting the job done. And no doubt he has the authority of the church in Jerusalem as an evangelist. He's out there and he's scattering. He's uh, preaching the word wherever the Holy Spirit leads him. That's why we should pray. If you look at your Wednesday night bulletin, you'll see so many evangelists that we support by the month. And the reason we do uh, is that they are living by faith. They're out there on the road. 
uh, two plus dollars uh, a, a gallon for diesel. Many of them are pulling a fifth wheel and such. They're living on the road. And of course, the, uh, uh, the, the, the calling of evangelism is a little bit different. Uh, Philip was running down a chariot, and, and, and the evangelists today are living in the chariot. <laughs> You'll get that on the way home. Pray for Brother Noah Fry. I love that gentleman. Him and his wife have suffered, and they are uh, recuperating, and I love them in the Lord. And pray for Russ and Mamie Bell. These are two missionary evangelists uh, that we support. Many others you'll see on our uh, support list. But isn't it good to know that Philip, number one, was obedient to the commands of Christ in going to Samaria to begin with? He went there, my folks, my brother, my sisters. And God blessed him for that. You need a blessing? Be obedient to God. Just be obedient to God. Whatever the Lord speaks to you in Scripture, do it. Amen? And you know, there's only five or six things that God has asked us in Scripture specifically to do. You find one of those, try to do all of them. Amen? Not just one. Uh, you, you, you just follow the scripture, uh, given it shall be given. You know, you're going to be judged for that. Uh, if God speaks to you to expressly uh, speak to someone uh, while you're in the checkout line, go right ahead. You know, they may not be witnessed to by anyone else. Have you thought about it? The soul winners uh, in our country are getting fewer and fewer. Matter of fact, the soul winning churches are getting fewer and fewer. Now, we're not the only ones. There's many around this country that still are practicing, even in the COVID times. Uh, uh, you know, people are hungry. People are receptive, as I have found. And uh, we sensed it this morning. Many of our old members were back and many visitors among us. And so people are looking and searching. They're doing some soul searching uh, during this time. And we need to be the ones to give them the gospel. Amen? Give them the gospel. And Philip preached unto them Jesus. He preached to, to these boys and girls, men and women, boys and girls. He preached to them life. He preached to them uh, about Christ. And, and uh, there is no life outside of Christ. You're looking for something in this world to satisfy your hungry soul. You'll never find it outside the perimeters of a local New Testament church. Why? Because Christ is the head and we're his body and we are working together for the sake of the gospel and the preaching and the spread of the gospel around the world. And so the gospel must be preached. Uh, who will God use? Who does he have but us? We're his hands, we're his feet, we're his tongue. And so when God said, go, Philip went. And that's why God turned and coined the, the phrase here, he's the evangelist. You know, some people are still looking for what it is that God calls and wants them to do here on planet Earth. Wouldn't it be good if God would raise up some more preachers, if God would raise up some more soul winners, uh, if God would raise up some more teachers uh, and some uh, school teachers? Praise the Lord. Wouldn't that be wonderful? That would just bless my heart. And notice it's chapter 8 and verse number 26. Did you get that? That, that Philip was called to go and he went to... You know, my daddy's birthday is 826. I, I, the Holy Spirit just happened to remind me here that my dad was more of an evangelist. Uh, that he, he called himself a pastor, but you know what? He never stayed anywhere very long at all. And, and, you know, I used to think that it was the military that did that to my dad because he was always moving somewhere else. Amen. But I think the Holy Spirit was involved in my dad moving from one place to the other place because he was just trying to be obedient to the Lord. He'd go to a meeting. My, my mom would never want my dad to go to these big meetings, and he would be asked to preach. After the service, someone from a pulpit committee would come up to my dad and pull on his coattail and said, Preacher Crane, we need, a, we need a preacher down here. We don't have a preacher right now. He said, I'll come and can't. He said, I'll just come and preach to you. You know the rest of that story. Good night in the morning. You know, we need preachers in every community. I said, every little town, every little hamlet, every little village, every little city 
in America. We don't need super mega churches. What we need is more churches to spread out, to get the gospel out. You notice what God was so upset with that they tried to saturate Jerusalem and build a super church there with over 100,000 members, but yet they weren't going where all the places that God told them to go. God knew how to scatter them. Amen. Then we see, secondly, Philip was obedient in running down the chariot. Ah, he saw the chariot, and he was an official chariot. This was a head of state. This was the treasure for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. And no doubt there was some beautiful horses. No doubt there was, they were galloping all in synchronization. And no doubt they, they probably had bells on their toes or something. They had their toenails uh, clipped and, and colored. I'm telling you, this was a royal chariot. How would you like it if a big uh, limp, stretch limo came pulled up here tonight uh, or, or when you go to the gas pump after church tonight and the Holy Spirit said, sick of Maybe a head of state. Maybe Mr. Donald Trump himself. We have Donald Trump that rides to church every Sunday with a chauffeur, his name is Bob Dillard. Y'all will get that. <laughs> Don't you love Brother Bob? He's not here with us tonight. I hope he's watching. We love you, Brother Bob. And pray for Sister Carol, his dear wife. She, her feet hurts her so bad, and they're planning and scheduling some kind of surgery uh, for her to eliminate or alleviate at least this pain, and it's so very painful. And so what do you do? What do people do without the Lord? Where do we go but to the Lord during these times? And look, folks, we've seen God's hand on a lot of the people of our church. Uh, I, I can't claim a, a supernatural, miraculous power like Philip had over there in Samaria, but I can see the good hand of God. God. I see God touching lives, changing lives, bringing uh, 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 medical healing through uh, whatever means. It doesn't matter how he uses or what he uses, just as long as we have uh, God's answer to our prayer. Amen. And so, praise the Lord, Philip was obedient. Have you been obedient? I said, have you been obedient in the faith of what God has asked you to do? How do we know when we're casually just talking with someone? Maybe it is the gas pump. Maybe, maybe it is uh, the checkout line. Uh, maybe it is uh, over there uh, when someone gives you a gift card to go out to eat uh, and you're sitting there enjoying the blessing, but you don't in turn give return of thanks by saying, hey, ma'am, can I just tell you a little something good? I know you hear enough bad news in the world. How about some good news? Do you share with them the gospel? of the Lord Jesus. This gentleman here that, that Philip was told to speak to was already, how did God know this man was interested? He put the two together, did he not? He put someone who was already interested and receptive and was reading the Bible and could not understand. How can I, how can I understand, he said, except some man should guide me. And then he preached unto him from this passage, Jesus and you know, when I was in the prisons uh, uh, around the world, I, I was an evangelist. I wore out more of these New Testaments. That's all I carried was a New Testament. Kept it in my back pocket. Uh, you know, you, you have a, uh, these guys that carry these guns. Uh, you, you have a, a, a revolver, but then uh, what do they call these little ones? The ladies carry in their purses. Is it a Derringer? There you go. And, and, you know, the New Testament is, is a power pack, uh, but, you know, it's small. If you get this big Bible here out and you go down the road on soul winning visitation night, by the way, I'm praying about when to start that back up. We go out on Saturday, but I want to start door knocking again soon. Right now they're saying to me, and I'm getting the reports that uh, we need to just saturate and literature, just saturate these neighbors. That's what we've been doing. But if you go out on visitation with this big Bible or a big family Bible, you're going to scare somebody half to death. What is that guy doing? He's going to knock me over the head with that. I know that's for sure. I had some folks, I was losing a chain yesterday off my truck, and, and some folks came around me, and they was waving me down. I thought they was wanting to hijack me somehow. I didn't know what in the world to think, and they were just being a good Samaritan trying to share me, with me. Uh, you know, but you never know nowadays. 
You, especially if somebody's waving you down and trying to get your attention. You just never know. Am I right or wrong? And, and so when people see you coming, and, and you know, you're, you're all dressed up, you got this big Bible out there. Look, just carry one you can just pull out like this right here. This is what I use. Nine-tenths of all, every time, right here. We've got a gentleman in the church that says he'll give you $100 if you can ever catch him without one of these. I want to ask that gentleman, it's not the $100 that I want. I want to ask that gentleman that's got the, the, the challenge, are you handing out these? It's no good in the pocket. Thank you, Brother Jim. It's not the up towards heaven. Hallelujah. But look, I, I didn't mean to embarrass Brother James, but, but if I went around the room tonight and asked you, are you handing out and are you sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you being an evangelist? Are you being a soul winner? You know, it's the duty not of just the preachers and the deacons of the church. It's the duty of every Christian to get on fire for Jesus Christ. I mean, some Christians, they're lifeless. They haven't come in contact with the Holy Spirit in so long. If the Holy Spirit were to ask them to say something about Jesus, they would blow a gasket. Well, I think we better be close to God enough so that when he does ask us to do and say something for him, that we would be at our best. Amen? Praise the Lord. And then it says, uh, some man here, I got you to underline that uh, in, in verse number, uh, what verse was that? I asked you to underline that in your Bible. Some man and, then, excuse me, verse number 34. I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself, uh, or of some other man. Now think about it just for a moment. Why don't you think about this some man that was sent? And without this some man, these some other men would never hear the preciousness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's people who are wanting to know. There are people who are receptive. Don't think that everyone is alien to the truth. Don't think that everyone is, uh, uh, you know, distant and everyone is hateful. I found in our area that most people are very kind and polite. Just make sure you're in the spirit when you go. If you have the spirit of God, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace. Uh, your countenance has changed. Uh, your facial features, uh, you're smiling, you're happy, you're overjoyed to talk to these people. Guess what? They'll be overjoyed to talk to you. Some people say this, well, pastor... Uh, I, I get this sometimes. No one wants to be my friend. I don't have a friend in the church. I don't know what to do. You're still in grade school. The, Bi the Bible says if a man uh, needs friends, he must show himself friendly. He must have put himself out there. And so if we need souls and want souls to be saved, listen, you have to be friendly. You have to be folksy. You have to talk uh, on the level uh, of, a, of a lay person and not give them all of these theological discussions. They don't need that. Put the jelly down on the bottom shelf and just speak your heart and tell them what Christ means to you and tell them what he's done for you uh, in your life. Surely you can quote John 3.16. Don't you tell me you can't. Uh, Pastor, I don't always take a track around with me. I don't know if I can say the right thing or do the right thing. Oh, shush. You know John 3.16. There's enough power, enough gospel, enough blood of Christ in John 3.16 to save the world. I think we complicate the gospel. Man tries to complicate. God tries to simplify. Let's get back to the work, folks. Let's get back to the work. Oh, listen, I mean, uh, we, we could sit in our lazy boy lifestyles. Uh, oh, we, we could uh, continue in our, uh, you know, country club uh, membership, and, and we could uh, flit around, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and act like the rich and the fun. Uh, we could do all of that, sit by the swim pool and, and wait our uh, uh, feet in the water and do this or do that or do the other, but their souls dying and going to hell. Which is it? Which one we want to do? It's not either or. You know, the Bible is very emphatic in the Great Commission. It says, go ye. 
Did you know if you look that up in the language that's written in, this is how it says it. As you're going into all the world, preach the gospel. God knew we would already be going. Did you know someone has said to me, and this statistic came across my desk, that in the lifetime of the average United States citizen, I don't know about the rest of the countries of the world, that we within a lifetime travel the earth's circumference four or five times. That's how many miles we travel. I don't know about you, but I travel a lot. I go a lot, and I'm constantly putting fuel uh, in these things. And you do too. And we go here, and we go there, and we go all over, all over the place. You know, that's one of the predictions. That's one of the prophecies of Daniel. Men shall go to and fro in the earth. This is a last day prophecy. And are we not going as he said we would be going? Does the scripture also say in the book of Daniel, it says this, that knowledge shall increase. Talk about technology. My grandfather was born in 1910. Uh, my mother's or my dad's uh, father was born in 1900. Well, what do you think? Uh, you think they've seen a little change in their life from uh, 1900 uh, to when they passed from this life? Maybe they were 80 years of age, 1980. You, you, you think they saw a few things change in the world? What is that? It had been the same for centuries upon centuries of time. And suddenly, right here at the end of the age, right here at the end of the church age or the grace age, things have come together like God said that it would come together. I preached, uh, I preached one service here, got on a plane on Monday morning real early. And by the time of the next service, I was preaching uh, uh, close to, Manila, Philippines. Never been on such a flight. Uh -huh. Miss Crane can tell you, she, she went with me, and it was one of my preacher boys from uh, my youth department uh, when I was in Orlando, Florida as a youth pastor, and the whole family uh, got in, and, and, and uh, they all surrendered, four boys surrendered to preach the gospel. All of them are serving the Lord tonight. My brother Mark Palomani, we support here as a missionary, is doing a fantastic job. I'm just thinking... You know, technology has increased. Oh, yeah, technology has increased. And, and while we were there, can I just throw in a few little things? While we were there, we saw uh, everything from uh, pedal bicycles, and they were, you know, people in the carriage with them, bicycling people around. We saw motorcycles. Uh, we saw fancy cars. We, we, we saw a little of everything, mopeds, everything. But that just goes to show you that in just a short amount of time, our world has completely changed from what it was doing a hundred years ago. Now, with that in mind, there's an urgency tonight. That this, listen, God is not going to allow us to go much further without intervention. He's coming. I said, the Lord is coming. And with that, we should not sit by and let this whole world die and go to a devil's hell. We need to be like Philip the evangelist. And I want to say lastly, no wonder Paul identified and wanted to visit this hero in the faith when he came to Caesarea. You know, your testimony precedes you. Did you know you can trust a soul winner? I, I mean, listen, he's not going to poison you at breakfast after he put you up that night. That's what Paul wanted to go. You know, you couldn't just stay. They didn't have motels. They, they stayed with people that they could trust. Who better? Here's a man in Caesarea. They're traveling here. And, and uh, I'm just saying that this man got saved and he's winning other people to Christ. Uh, and there's a good possibility, uh, listen, that your whole family can count on those who are winning souls. You don't have to check them. You don't have to recheck them. You don't have to scrutinize them. You don't have to run some kind of uh, background check on them. You know why? Their priorities in the right place. They're living for Jesus. They're doing exactly uh, what God's told them to do. By the way, Here's a good way to think about this. You know why I think Paul I could go to Caesarea and, and check in uh, at the Philip Hotel there in Caesarea? Uh, or, listen to this. Philip's four daughters 
were soul winners. It says they prophesied or they gave testimony of Jesus Christ. So I'm saying the fruit don't fall too far from the tree. Philip was a soul winner. His children were soul winners. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that children are actually uh, influenced uh, by their parents? Uh, many times you can see the same occupation. Many times the same uh, uh, kind of trade uh, is passed down from one generation to the other generation and on and on and on. But wouldn't it be better if the spirit world worked in the same way that as we came and drew closer to Christ, uh, that we were a great and a powerful influence upon our children and the, our children's children? They want to do the same as us. Oh, listen, I'm thinking tonight, uh, oh, listen, how is it with your family? What lessons, uh, listen, or, uh, what, what's going on? What lessons can we learn from Philip and his family tonight? Are, are there a whole lot of melodramas going on in your family situation? Maybe we should pick the brain when we get to heaven of Philip. How'd you do it? A lot of prayer. A lot of praying, a lot of fasting and praying, amen. My wife, she went off to the ladies' meeting. Ladies, did y'all enjoy that ladies' conference? She said, Sister Vasek made this statement. This is just one little tidbit she gave me from the ladies' conference. She said, Sister Vasek, in whom my dad's preached for a couple of times in Connecticut, brother, the Connecticuters, got to count them in. He, she said this about uh, her life. She said, the hardest thing that I've ever had to do the hardest thing without a doubt was raising children. Get them from point A to point B, C to D, and on and on and on. And if you're a parent here tonight and you have the fear of God, you know that that lady was telling the truth. I'm saying with much earnest prayers, it's no glory to anyone on earth if they turned out halfway decent. And even some of the best families that I know, their children turned south and went on their own direction. But it wasn't because the parents were living ungodly. It was because there was a rebellious heart. You know in the best of situations, in the best of families, things like this happen all the time. So think on what I just said about parenting and about uh, you know, how we influence our children. Listen to John 15 and 8 with this in mind. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Hold on. It's not all of it. Semicolon. So shall you be my disciples. Hmm. The Lord's interested in us reaping the harvest. The Lord's interested in us reaching our generation for Christ. The, the disciples in their generation, there was 250 million people living on planet Earth at the time, but they only had ships. They didn't have computers. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have any of those things. They had chariots, okay? <laughs> but can I tell you, when they got to heaven, they, they heard, well done. Because the first century, we're probably here tonight because of the witness of the first century Christians. They didn't just give a tenth of their income. They gave 100%. They brought it to the apostles' feet and cast it down at their feet. That's why the gospel was able to go into all the world. So praise God. Thank Him when we get to heaven. I said when you sit down with the elders, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and then the gospel preachers, the four Gospels. We'll have time, amen. <laughs> hey, but don't forget to go to the Lord Jesus and thank him for what he did at the cross. But everybody wants to be a soul winner. But in fact, listen, you need to go with someone who's dedicated as a soul winner before you ever become an effective soul winner. Why? Because you need to learn. You need to be in uh, mentorship. You, you need to just let someone take you under their arm and be their partner and be their prayer partner and don't interrupt and don't try to hit the points. You just stay put and stay quiet and keep the dog down. 
I've had people that just interrupt, 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 and I had to tell them afterwards, shut up. I had them right there. God had them, and you were grieving the Holy Spirit. Someone's got to be the prayer partner. Now the question is, which one gets more reward in heaven, the one that actually draws them in the net, pulls them in on, on board, or the one who's their pr the prayer partner, prayer power? I don't know if there's one more important than the other. Don't think because you're not an effective a soul winner that you're not getting credit. I believe like in basketball, you get an assist for someone getting saved. Amen? Why? Because uh, as the lady said, uh, that rearing children is one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do. Brother Scott, praying, if you do it right, that's the hardest work you'll ever have to do. Hey, do you think we can send some, some people off rejoicing, walking them down the aisle, letting them trust Christ as their Savior, be scripturally baptized, and introducing them to a Bible study teacher, letting them get started in their Christian walk with God? you think, you know, I don't care what continent you're living on. Y'all still listening or y'all fading out? <clears throat> I don't care what continent you're living on. I know the will of God for your life. The will of God for every person's life here in this room and around the world is this, to win souls. Go, win, baptize, teach. Four things you need to be involved with. Just pick one. Just start with go. <laughs> Do something different this week. You, you've got some lag time in there. You, you've got some time that you're not using for the Lord or anyone else. Uh, uh, maybe it's a ginkgo. You've you, you, you got something going on there and you're wasting time. Ephesians 5.14 for you if you're caught on the Nintendo ginkgo or whatever. Solitaire or whatever. Redeeming the time because the days are evil never seen such an evil time and age in our life. And here we've got the truth. The only faith that's exercised, the only, the only thing that's being exercised is your thumb muscles, not your faith muscles. Hold it. Y'all think I'm kidding. Grown men are staying up all night long. Racing some car. I hope that's all they're doing all night. Amen. Amen. But there's a little boy watching you do all that. And you shall know them by their... Yeah. The fruit of a Christian is what? The fruit of an orange tree is another orange. The fruit of an apple tree is another apple. The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. And your fruit, those children that you produced, we are known, whether we want to believe it or not, we are known by how our children turn out, whether it was our fault or not. Pray as hard as you can and fast and pray for your children. God loves them. I know you love them or you wouldn't pray for them. Now, if it worked for Philip, it'll work for you. Claim this verse. Write it down for me. You got a pen? This is the last thing I'm going to say to you. I promise. That roof hadn't fell in yet. I keep waiting on it. Psalm 126, 5 and 6. Just write that down in the flyleaf of your Bible. Be a good life verse if you don't have one. It's my son's life verse. How many miss old brother Johnny? Oh, I asked him, I said, son, you coming down for Thanksgiving? Oh, no, daddy, I got a baby born. Been born during that time. They grew up going on. Let me say this. Even if they're living a thousand miles away in the will of God, they're safer a thousand miles away in the will of God than they would be under my feet here at home. Psalm 126, 5 and 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Shout. They that goeth forth, weeping first, right here. There's no reaping because there's no weeping. They that goeth forth, a oh, preacher, I don't know, I can't win a soul. <laughs> Get in a prayer closet. They that goeth forth, weeping, bearing precious seed, 
that's the word of God, shall doubtless. I've never won any one soul to Jesus. Yeah, keep crying, but stay in your prayer closet and do it. They that go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. There's that word again, rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. No doubt about it. It says you will have people saved. One fourth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again. Bringing people down that aisle, letting them trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what the church is all about. The church is here to keep people out of hell. The church is here to disciple those people that we win and train them to be good Christians. Let's bow our heads, shall we, and pray. Father,